Good evening. Whew, it worked the first time. Um, welcome to the, the May California Colloquium on Water. This is our last lecture of the semester, and we'll start up again in the fall, in September. We don't have the speakers lined up yet, but we will soon, so we can get the word out to all of you. Um, and my name is Linda Vita. I'm the director of the Water Resources Center Archives, and we, um, my staff and I work to cr do all the logistical arrangements to make this series happen. And, um, but we get funding from um, many different college deans across the campus, and so um, want to recognize them. And I also work with a, there's a faculty committee that works together to help um, select the speakers and invite the speakers. Just a, one quick announcement in the back. We have some brochures and the, um, the email sign-up sheet. If you are not on our email reminder list, you can feel, please put your name and email down on that list and we'll send you an email about one week prior to each lecture. And a reminder that we also videotape each lecture and about two weeks after the lecture, they're available for viewing on our website and also uh, Google vi Video is now harvesting them. And one other announcement, which is I want to thank Metropolitan Water District of Southern California, who uh, recently sent a check to fund the digitization of all of the past videos that were not filmed in digital format so that we can also put them up on our website and Google Video can harvest them. So um, that's really great because we have about five years of past videos that we need to put up. Um, and with that, I think I, I would like to introduce Professor David Sedlak, who is on the colloquium committee and he'll introduce our speaker this evening. Thanks, Linda. Um, those of you who made it through the whole semester, congratulations, you're almost there. It's the end uh, coming. Um, you know, in getting ready to introduce Pat Mulroy, I, I went and did a little research on the web and I, I found a newspaper article that called her the Water Empress of the West. And um, it, re it jarred something in my mind to the last time I saw the name Mulroy and Water Empire in one place. And that was, of course, in uh, a movie that had uh, Roman Polanski and Jack Nicholson in it. And, uh, and, and Mulroy, in that case, was a pseudonym for Mulholland. So I don't know if there's some kind of cosmic connection here. You've probably heard that before many times. Uh, um, so maybe the next movie, they'll have Mulholland for the, uh, the Water Empress um, of the West. Um, but, you know, it really might be an apt title because in 1980, the population of the Las Vegas Basin was around 750,000 people, and in 1990, it was somewhere close to 1.4 million. And with that came uh, growth in water use on the order of 20% per year. And somewhere along the lines, the, uh, the bankers, they're the people who can do good math. I guess the people who do really good math in Las Vegas um, are gambling, but the other people do math in Las Vegas um, uh, realized that they were going to run out of water, and they started getting nervous about development. And that's when the, the, the Southern Nevada Water Authority um, and, and the Las Vegas Water um, District were, were created. And in 1989, uh, Pat Mulroy uh, was one of the architects who helped form that organization and get it going. And in the time since they've started, they really have pulled things together and taken an area where there was a traditional approach to Western water management that is fighting among yourselves and brought it together into a unified group of water districts under one central authority. And, um, have done incredible things along the lines of uh, infrastructure and planning, uh, some work in conservation, and it's all facilitated the continued growth of Las Vegas. And so uh, it'll be very interesting to hear tonight what we can learn from the Las Vegas experience of the past, gosh, 17 or 18 years. It probably seems like an, a blink of an eye to you, um, and, and, and what it holds for our future. So I'm looking forward very much to hearing uh, comments from Pat Mulroy. Okay, can you hear me now? All right. 
Well, I am delighted and privileged, feel privileged to be able to be here um, this evening and share with you the Las Vegas journey, the Nevada journey, in something we thought we had nothing to worry about there about 20 years ago. Nevada's a very different place. Let me put you in a different place here for a second before we start talking about the water situation in southern Nevada. Nevada and California, as I have come to learn over my last 18 years bonding with my friends in Southern California on the Colorado River, are like two different countries. I'm a native of Germany, and so I grew up in an environment where French don't speak to the Germans and the Italians don't speak to anybody. And I understand that mindset when you have shared boundaries and you are culturally very different. But when I moved to the United States, I was naive enough to believe that um, this was one country and so there was a whole lot more synergy than I have since learned that there exists even amongst Western states. Along the Colorado River, those aren't seven states, those are seven very, very different cultures very, very different value systems, very different laws that bring those value systems to life. Nevada is like a late bloomer. I've often compared Nevada to a gangly teenager, which is probably its point of evolution that it has reached at this point. A hundred years ago, in 1905, Nevada adopted a very stringent groundwater law. People only lived in northern Nevada. There was nothing but a whistle stop on the Union Pacific Railroad in southern Nevada. A Couple of crazy people had decided to live down there um, to help the Union Pacific Railroad. The Mormons had given up trying to turn it into an agricultural area because the soils and the climate just weren't conducive to it. So Brigham Young had brought everybody back to Salt Lake in the mid-1800s. And in 1905, in a very agrarian state, Northern Nevada adopted probably one of the most stringent groundwater laws anywhere in the United States. Unlike its western neighbors, which have for the most part water laws based on safe yield, which assume a certain amount of mining of groundwater supplies can take place, Nevada, because it is the driest state in the United States, and Las Vegas is the driest city in the United States, it adopted the principle of perennial yield which means you cannot mine a groundwater basin. You can only take from the ground that which is replenished on an average annual basis. And so together with the USGS over the course of the 20th century, the state engineer's office and the USGS cataloged all the various groundwater hydrographic basins in the state of Nevada and assigned essentially water budgets to them. Those have been tweaked over the years, but it is rigid law in Nevada on precluding the mining of groundwater basins, which is our friends in Utah find very strange because we are so dry that they don't understand why we don't allow for the mining of groundwater. The next important year for Southern Nevada was 1922. That was the infamous year of the Colorado River Compact. And if you are a native Las Vegan, now in my generation there aren't a lot of those, uh, my husband happens to be one, but those that have lived in Las Vegas for 30 years or more have an enormous chip on their shoulder about that 1922 compact. The compact of 1922 essentially divided the Colorado River into two basins, the upper basin and the lower basin. The upper basin has four participating states, Wyoming, Colorado, Utah, New Mexico, and the lower basin has California, Arizona, and Nevada. The two, each basin was assigned seven and a half million acre feet, and in true lower basin fashion, unlike the upper basin that divided those supplies based on percentages, the lower basin divided them predicated on hard numbers, and those hard numbers, since no one was in Las Vegas at the time, left Las Vegas with a meager 4% of the lower basin's share, or 300,000 acre feet. 
California has 4.4 million acre feet, Arizona has 2.8 million acre feet, and Nevada has 300,000. That's it. And in those days in 1922, and the years thereafter, working up to the Boulder Canyon Project Act, which cemented those numbers. There was a lot of infighting in the Lower Basin, trying to make those numbers come to life. Las Vegas still wasn't being defended appropriately. In fact, the lore of the river is that the Nevada State Engineer had to be dragged out of the bar for the negotiating sessions in Santa Fe because he came from northern Nevada and didn't really care. There was no one in southern Nevada, so the Colorado River was absolutely inconsequential to him. We are, and I've said it before, we're the community that no one expected that really shouldn't be there. In fact, I had the opportunity to speak at the University of Utah here about three, four weeks ago, and had to spend a better part of my time defending the city's existence in a question and answer. When you speak to a large audience, particularly in um, other states, people either love Las Vegas because they've come and they've had a grand old time and they haven't lost too much money, they hate Las Vegas because they, they lost too much money, or they think it's a den of iniquity and can see absolutely no redeeming quality to the community even existing. I apologize, <laughs> but it's there, and it exists, and it's growing in leaps and bounds. The early growth of Las Vegas after the original land auctions of 1905, when Las Vegas began to creep into a growth mode, that was then kick-started with the completion of Hoover Dam and the introduction of air conditioning in southern Nevada that the growth had reached such a point that by 1971 our groundwater basin, which was supplying 95 percent of all the water in southern Nevada, virtually 100 percent, was tapped out. And the state engineer said no more. Well, that was when the state, through the help of its congressional delegation, in true western form, we took our tin cup, we went to Congress, and secured the money to build the southern Nevada water system which is a treatment plant and pump station which brings water from Lake Mead into the Las Vegas Valley. It was originally opened in 1971. It was then expanded in 1983 to its full 600 million gallon a day capacity to deliver the full apportionment of Southern Nevada's water. And in 1983 when the Bureau proudly turned the keys of the Southern Nevada water system over to um, Southern Nevada. It projected that that system was going to provide Southern Nevada adequate resources through 2025. That was the birth of the wrong graph, as we have now lovingly call it in Southern Nevada. Every growth projection since then has been dead wrong. They use this REMI model when the Center for Business and Economic Research every year does their population projections, they use this national model they call the Remy model, which has this nice natural growth curve. It doesn't work in Las Vegas. We keep waiting for the, the turn on the curve, and it's not happening. So we have modified that significantly. We were growing along at our steady pace until, as was said earlier, in the mid-1980s, things began to speed up. And probably what caused things to speed up was gaming reinventing itself. Indian gaming had come about, and the visionaries on the Strip, predominantly Steve Wynn, changed their focus from being gambling joints to being full resorts casinos and offering something well beyond just a gambling hall. When that happened and corporate gaming came into existence in its full machination, it was like someone had lit a fuse in southern Nevada. By 1989, which was the unfortunate year I became general manager of the then Las Vegas Valley Water District, which was the largest water agency in southern Nevada, still is, largest retail agency, we were all looking at our will serve letters that we had handed out and realized that we had more commitments out there than we had water resources with which to supply them. 
we had all merrily used as much water as we possibly could because the battle cry in southern Nevada was use it as quickly as you possibly can or California will steal it. So you need to use as much water as you can. Well, it worked. In 1989, the tension between the water agencies was so fierce, and the fear was so fierce, and we had a convoluted system in place on how we increased our respective allocations amongst five separate water agencies in Southern Nevada that the one little community of Boulder City, which is a federal charter city, a unique creature, built, it's where the construction workers for Hoover Dam lived and where now generation after generation has continued to live. They own all the land. They're a strict growth control um, community because they only, they do own all the land and only sell off X number of acres every year. They opened all their fire hydrants and let the water run down the street in order to ratchet up their allocation. It came, became pretty obvious to the five of us that something had to change. And so in 1989, we began to look at a supply and demand model for getting our municipal boundaries, looking regionally, and saying, how are we going to get through this? What do we have in water supplies? And what are the demands that are out there? After several grueling years of getting to know each other much better and getting to appreciate and understand each other much better. In 1991, we created the Southern Nevada Water Authority. And the, my board chairman at the time declared it a modern political miracle. And I still believe that it was one of those unique moments in time where the necessity was great enough and the right people were in the right places in the elected officials, amongst the elected officials, that miracles were possible. In creating the Southern Nevada Water Authority, we did a lot of things that would be perceived as anathema to Western water law. First, we threw away our priority water rights. Said this is the most useless piece of paper on the planet. When you think about what good is that priority water right, the only time it's of any value is when there's no water. So between cities, what that means is that in Las Vegas, water could be running down the street while Laughlin had nothing. That made absolutely no sense. And the only reason we have priority water rights is to avoid sharing shortages. We don't want to share a shortage. And we live in the belief that if we take our risk and we unload it on someone else, we're going to walk away and we're going to be fine while someone else is hurting. Well, it was so, the dichotomy was so gross in Southern Nevada, we said, this is absolute nonsense. And we threw them away. We pooled our resources. And in pooling them, we said, we will build the regional facilities to deliver water to our member agencies. Everyone has to adopt the same conservation measures. Everybody has to start behaving the same way in water resource management. And if we do that, then we don't need priorities. It has been an unbelievable success. There are only seven board members on the Southern Nevada Water Authority representing all water and wastewater agencies. And every agency only has one vote, no matter whether you're the water district that has 75% of the service area or your Laughlin, which has 2% of the service area. It makes no difference. And why? Because the way the voting is set up on all issues that relate to water resources or to dollars that somehow in debt an agency, it has to go back to the parent board for ratification. So every member agency has a veto. No one's ever used their veto. Since 1991, no one has ever used their veto. Why? Because what it did, it forced us as agencies to create, we've got a conservation committee, which is all the agencies working together. We have a finance committee, which is all the budget officers and finance officers of the entities. And we have the technical group, which is all the lead technicians from all the agencies. And by the time it works its way up to the managers 
And we meet as managers. We used to meet once a month. That was before they began to trust me a little more. We now meet every other month. Um, the issues are gone to where by the time it gets to the board, there's never a board fight. And water has been taken out of essentially that traditional political game. It's like a hands off. You can play politics with anything you want. You don't touch water. You get slapped really fast by the press, by the community. It is not something that is, the community is willing to let be kicked around like a political football. Because there's so little of it and our future depends on it. Since 1991, and we started very small, and when it was conceived, it was the most cost efficient way to do it was to take the water district, which was the only one of the member agencies that is not embedded in a municipality, but is a standalone statutory district, and make it the operating agent, essentially, for the water authority. So we're the managing partner. And every year, the board in January reaffirms the district as the manager, manager for the authority. And every year, they re-up my contract um, as manager for the authority. When we were in the middle of these discussions, and the water crisis was really brewing in southern Nevada, and as you can imagine, the financial community was getting really nervous, and the gamers were getting really nervous. We at the district, before the creation of the authority, filed on unappropriated ground and surface water in the state of Nevada. Because also in the 1905 law, because water is so scarce in Nevada, it is not tied to the land that overlays it. And water belongs to the people of Nevada. A water right in Nevada gives you no property right. It gives you, you have the right to use it. And not using it causes you to lose it. But you never have a real property right to that water. Now, you have a perfected water right, which you can sell in some portions of the state. But you do not have a true property right to water. You have permission to use it. And water is available for application to anyone in the state of Nevada. So we filed on unappropriated ground and surface water in Clark, Lincoln, Nye, and White Pine counties. As you can well imagine, I became really popular in rural Nevada really quickly. And it was a very difficult time period there in the early 90s because we had been told by our Colorado River Commission, which was five people appointed by the governor at the time, that the compact was etched in stone and that Nevada was never, ever, ever going to enjoy any opportunities for additional resources off the Colorado River. Well, to me, that was left one place to go, and that was into the state of Nevada, which is what we did. When we filed on that groundwater, the rural counties, and this is where history and personalities start playing into this, the rural counties went and hired the then former governor of the state of Arizona, Bruce Babbitt, to be their lobbyist and their advocate against us. So Bruce and I bonded early in my career um, as he became the mouthpiece and drummed up the environmental opposition, drummed up rural opposition, and went to war against Southern Nevada on developing these resources. And my statement to him time and again was, that's great. If we can't go into the state of Nevada, then tell me how we get water off the Colorado River. It can only go one of two ways. In the middle of this battle, Bruce Babbitt then becomes Secretary of Interior. And upon leaving the state of Nevada, he commits to the then governor of Nevada and to the people of rural Nevada that he will fix southern Nevada's problem on the Colorado River, now that he is king of the river. And he is going to fix our problem, and he's going to create new water for us on the Colorado River. We then spent the better part of the 90s talking about 
surpluses on the Colorado River. And I stand here today in 2007, and you almost want to start laughing when you think of how bitterly we fought over surpluses in the 90s. It produced some great results for Southern Nevada, and I'll get into those in a minute. But internally in Nevada, because we had created the authority, it changed the dynamic around the Colorado River Commission. And we were successful at the legislature to get the Colorado River Commission reconstituted. It is today seven members, and four are appointed by the governor, and three are members of my board. So now Nevada's representation was a united front. There were no dissenting voices anymore. We fixed all our problems internally. And unlike my other friends, my friends in the other states where, you know, the state representatives always had to go back and do battle with their local constituency, we sat as one voice at the table and could make decisions quickly and react quickly and could commit. So in the 90s, a couple of things happened for Nevada that laid the foundation for what we've been dealing with here over the last several years. I mean, the big battle cry of the 90s was to wean Southern California of its overuse of the Colorado River. California's allocation of 4.4 million acre feet had really been 5.2, 5.3 million acre feet in some instances, because under the law of the river, any state's unused apportionment in the lower basin another state could use if that state wasn't using it. Nevada wasn't using its. Arizona was use, not using large share of their water. And so California was using it. Well, the state of Arizona in the early 90s created the Arizona Groundwater Bank. And it's an institution that I have grown to really appreciate. What they did is they have any number of overdrafted groundwater basins along the CAP aqueduct. And they created a state agency under which they took unused, un unused Colorado River water from their apportionment and recharged their groundwater basins with it, creating a, essentially a savings account of water. And they, some did it through um, infiltration basins. You could do it through direct recharge. Or the Arizona law was amended to cr allow for in lieu recharge which means an agricultural district that has a groundwater right would be paid to let that groundwater right sit there, not use it, have the recent financial resources to use CAP water instead, and for every year of non-use of that groundwater allocation, it aggregated in a savings account. Well, when Arizona did that, they all of a sudden were using all of their Colorado River water, and California needed to make some changes in how it used it. I'm not going to go into the painful machinations of the QSA. I'm sure you've heard about those um, ad nauseum. But those were very difficult years. Um, as a Nevadan, it was hilarious to me that I was spending more time in Sacramento than I was in Carson City as we were getting to the last rounds of these fierce battles. The interim surplus guidelines that were put in place by Interior allowed Nevada and California to tempor temporarily use water that's in storage in Mead and in Powell, essentially unused upper basin water, while we developed new water resources. And at the same time, Nevada entered into a historic arrangement. This was the first time there was a interstate arrangement um, of this nature on the Colorado River. Nevada became a customer of the Arizona Water Bank. We were paying exactly what Phoenix or Tucson or Tempe were paying, and if there were water supplies left over that those cities didn't need to put in the water bank, Lost Southern Nevada was given the opportunity to buy those, and Arizona would bank them for us, and then we would take them through an exchange and a forbearance agreement when we needed them. Arizona committed to 1.2 million acre feet of banked water. 
That was historic. Between the interim surplus guidelines and the Arizona Water Bank by the year 2000, I could stand in front of my board and tell them that they had a firm 40, 50 year water supply. Now in my mind, I always knew that the opportunity existed for that bank to go on for a much longer period of time. Um, it was limited at first to 1.2 million, but that doesn't mean time and circumstances don't change. And we all assumed that the Colorado River was healthy. That was the fatal flaw. When the Bureau ran their models during the 90s, when we had those surplus discussions, there was zero probability that we would have the drought that we've been experiencing since 99-2000. Zero. There was not a chance it would happen. I now no longer believe in probabilities. They're right up there with the wrong graph. <laughs> By 2000, we had less than normal inflow into Lake Powell. 2001, it was again a less than normal year, but we'd had less than normal years before. By 2002, the wheels came off the wagon. Never before had we had a year where we only had 25% of normal runoff from the Rockies. Lake Powell cratered. And all of a sudden, everybody started getting nervous. What it did to Nevada was devastating. We went from a 50-year water plan to nothing overnight, just like that. There was no interim surplus anymore. And the state of Arizona was in such a localized drought that the Salt River Project had made a call on its share of Colorado River water and had taken up all the excess. And we were notified by Arizona there was nothing to bank. So we had no bank and there was no surplus. This was the great fix that Bruce Babbitt had promised us in the early 90s. And all of a sudden, we had nothing. That moment in time, in 2002, when we had to make a course correction of 180 degrees has changed everything in Southern Nevada. We spent 2002 looking at each other, half laughing, half moaning, going, why didn't I retire sooner? We had all talked about a shared shortage arrangement, never assuming we'd ever have to put it in place. We figured that would be the next generation of water managers that might have to deal with it. But certainly not us, those of us who had put this regimen in place. So in very difficult conversation during the year 2002 at the staff level, we put together the shared shortage plan and a drought plan. And the way it manifested itself was that the SNWA board adopted a blueprint drought plan which then every city council and the county commission had to change its building codes, its water rates, its watering schedules, and it had to be the same. None of this, if you lived in Henderson, you had one set of rules, and if you lived in Las Vegas, you had another set of rules. If you're gonna share the, the wealth of the surplus, then you're gonna share in the pain when it's not there. Some of us were a little worried about whether every city council would do it, but they did. Because the business community was solidly behind us. The developers said to us, we don't care what the rules are as long as they're the same throughout the valley. So where one piece of property I own in Henderson all of a sudden doesn't have a different value from land I have in Las Vegas. If it, the rules are the same everywhere, we really don't care what the rules are. The centerpiece of the conservation plan was a water smart landscaping program. Why are we doing this? I said earlier, we recycle water 100%. If it hits a sewer system, it is recycled. It is either directly recycled through regional rec uh, reclamation facilities 
or we send it to tertiary facilities that treat the water, return it to the Colorado River, and for every gallon we put in, we can take a gallon over our allocation out. So if you do the math, if you had no landscaping outside, you could perpetually reuse Southern Nevada's water. It would be perpetually reused. Our biggest water user is our landscaping, bar none. It is residential lawns. And I'll lay you apples to oranges. Three quarters of you in here are going, yeah, right. It's the fountain in front of Bellagio. <laughs> it's the canals at the Venetian. You couldn't be more wrong. The entire Las Vegas Strip uses 3% of our water. That's it. And with that 3% is the largest economic force in the entire state of Nevada. It's the largest employer. It's the largest taxpayer. And to look at, when you look at it economically, you, I can't stand in front of my board or the community and say investing 3% of our water supply in our economic engine is a bad investment. So we focused, we were strategic when we did this because we said this gives us an opportunity through this drought plan and this sharing sh of shortages to take the culture in Southern Nevada and move it to the next level and create a, some permanent conservation measures. So the centerpiece was, we lovingly called it our Cash for Grass program. And we started off by paying our customers a dollar per square foot to take turf out. At the same time, we raised water rates 40%. <laughs> Little incentive to take that turf out. But we were paying. We have since then raised it to $2 for the first 1,500 square feet, and then a dollar thereafter with no cap. But we started with a dollar, and the demand was unbelievable. We further went and said, this is a desert. And it is a desert where the temperatures in July are about 118 and where the winter temperatures are in the 40s. And I know this comes as a culture shock to you, but you need not water when it's 40 degrees outside the same way you water when it's 118 degrees outside. So every dutiful husband went to the garage and rediscovered his sprinkler clock. And we said, you can water your turf three days a week in the fall and in the spring, once a week in the winter, and then we kept the time of day restriction during the summer months. We put golf courses on a water budget. Golf courses were using anywhere from 12 acre feet per acre of golf course to five acre feet per acre of golf course. I mean, the 12 acre feet, they were turfing their parking lots. So we said, it's got to go. So we put them on a water budget. They could not exceed 6.3 acre feet per acre of golf course. If they did, they would pay a penalty in the millions at the end of the year, a multiple of their highest water bill. And we didn't care whether it was reclaimed water or drinking water. These changes, along with water waste enforcement, and we don't have to. The thing I learned is you don't need a water waste Gestapo to put water waste restrictions in and find people for when they water at the wrong, on the wrong day or have water running off their property. When you're a community lo like Las Vegas that has lots of senior citizens, they love to squeal. <laughs> you just need a bank of customer service agents who will answer their calls and send the enforcers out. The changes that we made, and they were painful. Um, we, even tr we learned some lessons. I never appreciated the value of fountains. I was naive. Fountains and car washing. We tried forcing people to use car washes that had, because car washes have these recycling systems in Southern Nevada, and prohibit people from washing their own cars. Oh my goodness. I was never yelled at so much. I think, you know, our retirement communities, people have, on Wednesdays, they wash their car. It's part of their habit. It's their routine. You do not mess with that. Fountains. I attempted <coughs> to 
We, we attempted to create an economic differentiation. On the Las Vegas Strip, if you were to turn the fountains off, it would have an economic impact. There is a, you cannot convince anyone that if all of a sudden the canals at the Venetian were dry, the Venetian wouldn't see a drop in registration. Now, they may not care about the little fire, pathetic fire hose in front of New York, New York, but they will care about the Venetian. They will care about the Bellagio Fountains and the Mirage Volcano and all those other water features on the Strip, which, by the way, is recycled water. They all double plumbed their facilities and have reclamation facilities in the basement of their um, parking garages. But if I go to the grocery store or to the dentist, I really don't care if there's a fountain in the parking lot. I will go shop at Vons whether the fountain is on or whether it's off. I will go see the dentist every year whether the fountain is on or whether it's off. So we attempted to create this economic differentiation and we were bludgeoned. A psychiatrist, I woke up one morning, turned on the local news, and a psychiatrist is screaming that his patients require the sound of a babbling brook that runs through his business park to soothe their nerves. I sent him a sound soother CD. <laughs> the passion around fountains, we finally came up with a compromise and said, fine. If that fountain is that important to you, if you take out enough turf to equal 50 times the amount of water that that fountain uses annually, you can keep your fountain. And they did it. I kid you not, they've done it. They've taken all the turf out, but they will not touch the fountains. What you see in Las Vegas now is a lot more artificial turf. You see a lot more desert landscaping, native landscaping, and it was an education for the public that it's not rock, a cactus, and a dead cow skull, that there's any number of plant life that will survive in the Nevada desert. I had my own personal war with my husband because as a native, his attitude, I was here first, I keep my lawn. When, when everyone goes back where they came from, I'll take mine out. But until then, I'm going to keep my lawn. Well, I threatened to do it while he was away in Ireland with my son, so we came to an <clears throat> amenable compromise on that issue. But turf has been coming out. In, two, in less than two years, we cut Southern Nevada's water use by a third by doing that. We went from 325,000 acre feet of consumptive use to 265, just like that. It's all about how you grow, not wh whether you grow. And what has happened in southern Nevada is developers are now building a lot more what I would call next generation developments, and a lot driven by land prices. The lots are narrower, uh, they are smaller, They're, they build them with native vegetation everywhere, with bike trails and hiking trails. They put in common areas that have grass for fields and, and park areas. But it's a very different kind of development. We've gone from the LA sprawl type development to more of a Manhattan development. And remember, inside use is recycled. We don't lose it if we use it inside. So when I see high rises go up, there's a lot of water saved in a high rise. It's the sprawl that kills us in southern Nevada. Having put that shortage, that conservation plan in place, we also needed to move on to the next um, level of discussion with our friends in Arizona. Now, Arizona is being ravaged by a drought, and every time I talk about this, I have to give the Arizonans a huge amount of credit. Despite the unbelievable public pressure, they understood that if Nevada completely cratered, that it would hurt everyone on the river. So they agreed to an amendment to our interstate banking agreement in which they guarantee 1.2 million acre feet. And we're paying them $350 million in order to do it. We paid them $100 million up front. 
so that they could buy dry year options if they needed to in order to meet their commitments. The only condition we have, and we can use that during shortages, until the Arizona cities are shorted, and then we take a pro rata cut just like the Arizona cities do. So now Nevada and Arizona have a bi-state municipal shared shortage arrangement. We now had water in the bank. Now it got around. If we spent 10 years arguing about surpluses, God help us, how long was it going to take us to argue about shortages? To say that the last several years on the Colorado River have been ugly is probably an understatement. They were brutally ugly. There's nothing more compelling than the fear of running out of water. And I know I'm standing in California, and I understand what caused California, Southern, and I know it was Southern California, to do what they did, but there is no greater impediment on the Colorado River than the California priority. When California went to Congress in the late 60s, in retaliation for having lost the Arizona v. California case, and forced the CAP, completely subordinated, to all of California's Colorado River entitlement, it created an imbalance that we have been butting our head up against ever since. When the Secretary now declares shortages in the lower basin, only two states take it, Nevada and Arizona. California's opinion is that 1.2 million acre feet have to be cut out of Arizona's supply before they take one drop of shortage. That is the entire CAP. That is the entire municipal supply for the state of Arizona. I have never been a fan of that. I understand why it happened, but I think its time has come and gone. It ha and it created such fear in Arizona that it, the fact that we actually signed a letter to the secretary February a year ago conceptually agreeing to certain things, and on Monday signed a joint letter in response to the EIS on Colorado River shortages and entered into a historic seven states agreement is miraculous. People were stomping out of the room, states were leaving. The, it was brutally ugly. What we've finally done is we've moved the management of the Colorado River to the next level. Mead and Powell will now be managed in tandem with one another. We're finally going to let hydrology and real-time water existence manage how those reservoirs are operated, not obtuse legal words that were concocted long before anybody could imagine what the impacts were. We agreed to up to 600,000 acre feet of shortage in the lower basin to be taken only by Nevada and Arizona. Nevada will take 4% of the shortage. Arizona takes the rest. That's the shortage, the way the shortages work, when Lake Mead hits 1025, and it's at about 1120 right now, when it hits 1025 or 1075, the secretary will declare a 400,000 acre foot shortage. When, this, when it hits 1050, the secretary will declare a 500,000 acre foot shortage. And when it hits 1025, the secretary will declare a 600,000 acre foot shortage. Now, Nevada feels pretty comfortable that its reserves in the Arizona Water Bank in the first two levels will not be, um, will be able to use our banked water. And we're feeling pretty comfortable that um, depends on what happens in Arizona and when it happens. But we might even be able to make it through the third one. But we said once we get to a 500,000 acre foot shortages, the states have to reconvene and we have to talk about this again. Nobody can conceptualize that far into the future. And the irony is it might be tomorrow. If you, but nobody knows, and it's the uncertainty. And you know what? In a way, I welcome that. We tried in 1922 for once forever to lock in numbers, and you can't do that. The crystal ball is so murky. 
whether it's the hydrology changing. We may be fighting over water rights none of us have. The Colorado River was supposed to have 18 million acre feet in it. It probably has 13 to 14 million acre feet in it. It doesn't have 18, so we're all short right from the beginning. Things have to change. And we have to start thinking as a whole. When you look at it, if you can emotionally step back and you look at the river system and you look at managing it as a watershed and meeting the needs where the needs are at any given time when a drought hits, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Because you have so many exchanges that are possible. You have so many strengths and weaknesses that can be compensated with somebody else's strengths. And everybody has ownership in it. The thought that, the, that we would sit here in 2007 and believe we will be whole while our neighbor suffers is so counterintuitive. It makes no sense. Those were the days of old when Farmer Jones predicted his crop against Farmer Smith. We're talking about municipalities. We're talking about 18 million people not being able to share resources. That's a very different paradigm from where we came from. In its usual baby step fashion, these agreements that we're just now entering into on the Colorado River are the first step in that direction. But there is an Achilles heel to this agreement. And that is that the states have said Mexico will take 17% of the shortage. And you, United States, we are looking to you to make that happen. Now that is going to be a very interesting round of argument. And I expect it will be pretty ugly over the next several years as we deal with Mexico. Because put it all together for Mexico. Let's see. We're lining the All-American Canal. They're going to lose 67,000 acre feet of seepage. Southern Nevada, through this agreement, is going to pay to build a reservoir or drop structure on the All-American Canal to prevent over deliveries to Mexico, for which we will get a block of water um, in return for our investment. And then we want you to take 17% of the shortage. And oh, by the way, could you build us a desalter in order to augment the Colorado River supplies while you're at it? It's going to be difficult. I, there are solutions. That's the only thing that makes me optimistic, is there are solutions. And any, there's already a group in the lower basin beginning to look at what some of those solutions might be that can also protect the limitrophe and um, uh, create some water for the delta. I am encouraged by what happened amongst the basin states. As bloody and as ugly as it was during this time, we came to great closure at the end. The lower basin has actually agreed that it will not implement a call provision on the upper basin for the next 26 years. For those of you that don't know what that means, is under the Moses' law of the river, in the event the upper basin reservoir, Lake Powell, has insufficient supplies to meet the upper basin's Mexican treaty obligation, the lower basin can make a call on the upper basin. That means the upper basin has to start cutting off its users until it has made that obligation whole. Now you're talking about Colorado moves water across the, the continental divide from the west slope to the east slope. You've got all that agriculture and all, that, all those cities on the western slope of Colorado. You've got all of the San Juan users, including Albuquerque to some extent, Farmington, any number of Indian nations, and agricultural communities. You've got the Central Utah Project that moves wa water um, to the Wasatch Front in Utah. And you've got agricultural production up in the Wyoming area and you start cutting those users off in order to meet that obligation. We agreed that we wouldn't do that for the next 25, 26 years. That gave the upper basin some protection against what they saw as, was, as great uncertainty. The last piece for Nevada was we're building our in-state project. 
And I know many of you have probably heard about it, and you are less than enthusiastic about it. But in all honesty, Nevada has no options. Nevada doesn't have a lot of rivers. The next closest river to southern Nevada from the Colorado is the Humboldt in northern Elko County. And that's overused. But it has groundwater reserves. Our anchor basin was Spring Valley, and we went to hearing, and the state engineer has given us 60,000 acre feet of perennial yield water in there. We've also acquired another 10,000 acre feet of groundwater um, in that basin. We've also bought 33,000 acre feet of surface water, which we will not export. We fully intend to use 21st century technology to manage that groundwater basin and recharge it with the surface flows once they've come through the riparian area. We've entered into a stipulation with the federal lands and natural resource uh, stewards, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, BIA, BLM, Park Service, and they will forever manage that groundwater basin with us. It can be done. And we can, we've put the right things in place to make sure that it's done the right way from the very beginning. But Southern Nevada takes 90% of its water supply from the Colorado River. So if the National Academy of Sciences is right, and we have the potential of a pseudo dust bowl effect in the Colorado River Basin, it is our responsibility to bring water in from elsewhere in order to protect the community and diversify that supply. In my mind, that in-state project is more for drought protection than it is for growth. It is not about growth. You cannot meet 100% of the demand with 10% of the supply. And if our conservation efforts continue to be successful, our supply gets harder and harder and harder. There's less fluff in it. There's less waste in it. There's less easy cuts in it. Now you're into municipal inside use. We have to do something. We don't have a choice. So for that reason, we're going to continue to move forward. We're in ugly conversations with the state of Utah um, about a shared basin that we have with Snake Valley. But ultimately, we will come to resolution on that. Um, their motives aren't as pure as they would have you believe. Um, Cedar City has filed on 43,000 acre feet of water in the same area. It's about growth on the I-15 corridor. And where does that water come from? St. George is looking to move, build a pipeline from Lake Powell to St. George to deliver 130,000 acre feet of water from Lake Powell into the St. George area. When you take 130,000 acre feet out of Lake Powell, you increase the number of shortages that occur in the lower basin. So if you're asking Nevada to take more shortages, you cannot ask it to also not protect itself against those shortages. The world as we've known it for 150 years is gone. The climate on the Colorado River is changing. Overlay that with we're getting a reality check on what's really there. And the question for the entire West is do we really believe that the practices, the laws, and the cultural differences that we've enjoyed, and it has been a sport in the West to fight over water, will allow us to make it through this century? Is that a legacy we want to leave the next generation? Or do we not today have an obligation to begin to look outside the box and begin to think more as a watershed and more as absolutely interconnected states. Because what happens on the Colorado affects you here and you, because you're connected through the State Water Project. What happens up here affects us in Las Vegas and affects Phoenix because it pushes Southern California to the Colorado River. We're all interconnected. The future is not about independence. The future is about interdependence. And it is that central shift in our behavior in the West that lies at the root of whether we'll be able to survive or not. Independence is a luxury 
when you have a lot. Interdependence is the freedom to survive when those resources start shrinking. On a final note, and I know I've talked too long, we are building something that is really atypical for a water district that I just have to plug because I really want to invite you to come see it. We've built a un we're opening on June 8th a very unique Central Park in Las Vegas to make Las Vegas start thinking about the future. It's all about sustainability in all its facets, whether it's energy, whether it's land use, whether it's air, whether it's water. We've built the first two platinum lead facilities in a desert. One is a um, more of a cultural and his, uh, natural history museum. One is a desert living center with the largest sustainability library in the United States. All about how do you live in the desert. A six acre desert botanical garden with a section being deserts around the world where we feature plant life from every desert on the planet. The desert living center will not need air conditioning 330 days out of the year. 75% of the facility is solar. We have created a living machine to treat all the wastewater and take it to a cienega that we created out of a flood channel that we, or a flood detention basin that we ripped the concrete out of and put cattails in and 250 species of animals have returned. This is a 180 acre site. It is a unique central park and in it, our mission is to teach Las Vegans and begin the, get them to start thinking about what life in this century means and what changes they can start making in their everyday lives so that the community as a whole can survive. Because without it, desert cities like Las Vegas, like Phoenix, like Tucson, have pretty bleak futures going into what can only be described as a very uncertain climatic future. So thank you, and I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. Public document. And then the second question I have is um, there was, I know, with some of the other alternatives for the shortage guidelines, the concept of water. conservation before shortage, and um, then the power users had an alternative. Right. The seven states proposal and conservation before shortage are very, very close. They're very, very close. My question was whether or not the seven basin states agreement included that water banking would make it so for water, conserved water in Lake Oh, you're talking about conserving water in, oh, a water bank, you mean? Yes. Do you believe it? Um, California, Nevada, and Arizona are going to take advantage of it. It is one of those tools in our tool chest as we talk to Mexico, which obviously provides some opportunity. Yes, but we will be able to create what we're calling um, intentionally created surplus, and you can bank it in Lake Mead. It has an evaporative loss to it. But when we first started talking about banking in Lake Mead in the 90s, mm, the guns came out. So we've moved quite a ways. Yes? In, in this discussion about um, culture, that you're always interested in that, um, you didn't talk about corruption. And um, I, I'm really interested in corruption in arid lands and development. <laughs> and, uh, you know, coming from California, I think, um, our star performer is uh, San Diego, and um, San Diego's learned a lot from Las Vegas, and um, I mean, the family connection, family, family, the family connections are quite close, and um, are you really as optimistic, <laughs> I mean, in getting these cultures together and co collaborating oh, as yeah. you've seen? Yeah, I am. Now, I don't know what you mean by corruption, whether you mean corrupt land releases or... Um, no, I, I basically self-interest and the way that self-interest is protected as opposed to public interest. 
Well, but see, real estate. That's what I'm talking about. But see, there are a lot of ways where good public policy and public interest um, is the only way the greedy at heart get what they want. And the key is finding those, those, those connections. In other words, in order t to do what they want to do, they have to do the right thing. Yes. You mentioned, I think, taking 33,000 acre feet, and, and I guess you're in the Spring Valley? In yeah. Reservoir, and it's not in a reservoir. Right, no, sorry, service water. Right, so withdrawing it, injecting it, and then pumping that water and exporting it? No, we've, no? no we've got, there are riparian areas in Spring Valley that need protection, and so we're, and we don't want to overdraft the groundwater basin, and we want to manage that groundwater basin. That basin's going to go through droughts and through, um, episodes like every all the other areas in the West. But if we capture the water as it comes off the Shell Creek, once it's gone through the riparian area, rather than let it sit out in the desert floor and evaporate, we force it into the ground through infiltration basins, we can help stabilize that groundwater basin. We recharge in southern Nevada. We've got about 325,000 acre feet banked in our own groundwater. The same as just pumping it directly instead of injecting it in the ground? I mean, instead of pumping it out. And <coughs> but you're, prevent, you're preserving the environment by doing that. You've got the perennial yield, right. and you can let that basin rest. You don't, this is not a peaker. We're not building this to peak, and part of the management strategy is to manage it adaptively. If that area is going through a drought, then we won't pump. Yes? You mentioned, and Linda's going to tell you the restatement. Oh, I forgot to repeat the question. Okay. You mentioned the, the Utah pipeline and this 26-year hiatus that the states have agreed for in, to avoid calls on the Amber Basin. Is that, uh, how does that pipeline fit into this scheme? Is that something that's going to violate this agreement about the no calls? The question was whether or not the Lake Powell pipeline would violate the no call. Well, geographically, St. George is in the lower basin. I'm sure you can see the arguments emerging already. Yes? You mentioned uh, conversations with Utah. You're talking about buying the water, and no. also the upper basin states should never use their allocation. Can't you just buy it from them? You, OK, the question is, um, we were talking about a shared basin with Utah. Are we talking about buying it? Um, the other question is, um, the upper basin isn't using its allocation. Can we buy it? You cannot buy water on the Colorado River. You cannot buy water in one state and move it to the other without that state forbearing its use. And no state will forbear the use. That's why the creation of the Arizona Groundwater Bank was su such a wonderful invention, because it afforded Arizona a state tool by which it could create a bank that they could then lease out or sell, but they have centralized state control around it. The shared basin is a shared hydrographic basin where the state line runs right through the middle of it. The water's on the Nevada side of the line, most of the irrigated agriculture is on the Utah side of the line. Uh, three years ago, a Lincoln County Lands Act went through Congress. And in that Lands Act, a provision was slipped in that requires Nevada and Utah to enter into an agreement on how to manage the resources of that groundwater basin and other shared groundwater basin before any water can be moved out of it. That's the agreement. I'm talking about. Yes? The new park sounds very exciting and probably will teach a lot of people a lot about conservation, but I was wondering in the process in the many years that you went over, what do you think was the most effective form of education, and the example of your husband comes to mind, to get people to change their minds about their water use and about the water supply? The question was what was the most effective um, tool or event that happened that caused people to begin thinking about their water, how they use their water, correct? The drought. Uh, Las Vegans go to Lake Mead to boat, and the news would show that big bathtub ring in Lake Mead, and people got nervous. The docks 
the marinas had to be physically moved. The docks kept being floated further, further out into the lake. Um, a town named St. Thomas, which lies up by Moapa, all of a sudden reemerged from uh, um, in Lake Mead. It had been flooded when they filled Lake Mead, and all of a sudden St. Thomas is there. There were some people that live in Las Vegas today that were born in St. Thomas. So that's what did it. I think that, and we went on an aggressive campaign, and I. The media was really helpful, the business community was really helpful, but I think the reality of the drought and this barrage of news stories about climate, the climate changing and the Colorado River really becoming more arid than it already is has been a real wake-up call in Southern Nevada. So do you think you'll have to have these drastic sort of situations elsewhere to prompt such kind of conservation? I hope not, but... It usually is a pretty, the question was, would we need those kind of dramatic events to happen for changes to occur? You would hope not, but you never know. Human nature being what it is, my answer would be cynically probably yes, but that could be tomorrow. What happens in Southern California if the Sierra and the Colorado River are hit by a drought at the same time? You. That's today. <laughs> there you go. That's today. And you know what? The other thing is we're all going to end up looking at the ocean, whether it's desalted ocean water in Mexico or desalted water on the California coast. Um, it's got to happen. It's got to happen sooner or later. I just wanted to make a comment. I was in India recently. Enormous amount of foreign capital is pouring in. It's booming development everywhere. There's no water, there's absolutely no water planning. It's absolute chaos. So as I'm listening to you, the thought comes to my mind that India, everybody in India is supposed to be very smart. That's the common legend that goes on now. <laughs> that caught on to IT and software, but there is so much of lesson to learn about how the United States, Western America started with overusing water very aggressively and then has started learning its mistakes and modifying its habits. You just said up talked about human nature. There are two states in India now, Karnataka and Tamil Nadu. There is one river. They have tried every single compromise possible, the Supreme Court, nothing. One is fighting after the other, they are not sharing anything. One water, one river which is heavily used. And now you are talking about Arizona, Nevada, Nevada and Utah. They are all trying to come together and then try to manage a common resource wisely and intelligently. I just hope that India will learn something besides IT from this country. <laughs> I, mean, I really mean it. That is, water and the earth is so completely neglected in preoccupation with, again, there is rights. We have rights to accumulate wealth. So India is number two in the number of billionaires now behind the United States. Those rights are not But there is nobody to think about the earth and water. We take it for granted. It's, it's going to come to a devastating catastrophe. I mean, this, this is going so bad. I heard a report on um, the news at the end of last week that I guess the, the top generals in the Pentagon are now saying the number one threat to national security is climate change and its effect on the global water supply. Because we, can't, we can exist without power I mean, we may not like it, we may, our economies may crash, but as human beings, we will survive without power. We can't survive without water. Let's think about it. Even if tomorrow fusion energy works, you can get energy for nothing. You cannot indiscriminately move water one from one place to other simply because you can move it. We need to take because it. Because the, the infrastructure of the Earth's interconnected systems won't allow that. So it is not just the energy. Besides energy, there are other restrictions in this interconnected system, and then we have interconnected human beings too. Yes. And one of the 
One of the things I've said many times is water and Wall Street do not mix. Water works on a completely different paradigm than Wall Street. And when you start trying to make profits on water, that's when things really get off kilter. Yes, sir, in the back. Uh, two things. One is um, Las Vegas is one of the fastest growing uh, metropolitan areas, uh, from what I understand, in the United States. Are states, or, or would uh, your, your group and, and the government of the, of the states here in the Southwest eventually get to the point where they may even be willing to say that, I'm sorry, we can't, you know, more people means more water needed, and we just can't keep growing in the way that people would like to contribute to growth? I have been asked this growth question 999 million times. Um, uh, let me answer your growth question about whether Southern Nevada would ever limit growth this way. Let me do it in the microcosm first. Remember, it's not whether you grow, but how you grow. During the time period, we reduced our use by a third. We increased our population by 8,000 people a month. It is how we use that water supply. And remember, we're 100% recycled. So in theory, if you had nothing outside and you just kept recycling what's inside. Now let's talk macro. This country in the, by 2040 is supposed to increase by 100 million people. Where do you want them to live? I can't find a community that isn't no growth anymore in this country. Everybody wants them to go somewhere else, but no one ever stands up and said this is where we, they should go. California's growth is now self-sustaining. It's not in migration anymore. We're, what are we going to do with all these people? I'm not sure we have the luxury of putting walls up. Because whether they come to Las Vegas, whether they come to Phoenix, or whether they go to San Diego, makes very little difference in the bigger picture. And if you're going to have increased tornadoes and hurricanes and flood events, on the east, it's going to drive more people out of those catastrophes. I think climate change is going to have huge migrations happening. There's one town in Australia now that is actually looking at migrating the entire community to somewhere else because they have like 15 months of water left. Yes. I guess a follow-up question on that is, uh, I didn't hear you talk at all about the salt balance and, uh, and, and what happens if you keep recycling water. So uh, do you have any comments on, on where things would go eventually if you have a closed loop and keep adding salt? What do you mean adding salt? Oh, to the, we have to take it out. So what do you do with your brines? Goes to a landfill, and that's difficult. It is difficult. I think brine disposal is the biggest problem we have. And that's why inland desalt is so difficult. It is so much easier to do it when you're on the ocean. Inland is much more difficult. But the rel one of the things we're talking about in southern Nevada now is banning water softeners. We've got to ban them. So, yeah. In dollar terms, how much have you put into conservation efforts, for example, for recycling water? What is the capital outlay? And how much have we spent on conservation? Our cash for grass program or water smart landscaping program, we have spent about $100 million on that. And um, all things said and done, we're in it $150 million. What about recycling? And we make the developers pay that through connection charges. Uh, recycling? How much have we got in capital outlay? Well, we're about to build a billion dollar scope project. And you've got probably a billion dollars in assets sitting around the valley easily. So it's several billion. As far as startup for eager food, what's the one? Oh, dollars per acre foot. Um, I have to be honest with you, I don't have that number on the top of my head. We don't calculate it like that. 
Yeah. Your counterpart, Southern California MWD wholesale uh, supplier to many municipalities, what are the lessons learned that you think would be priority one and two for the new general manager of MWD? My good friend Jeff? Yes. What would be one and two and three that, you know, I, I happen to be a big fan of Jeff's. I like him a lot. It's a little bit of the canary in the mine shaft and what happens in Southern Nevada foretells what well, Metro Southern California, but Northern California. So, what would be the one or two top priorities for the metropolitan water district? I think what would be the number one and two priorities in Southern California? I think conservation needs to become a more regional, accepted way. I think we've, we're way complacent about water use, and Tucson went first, Las Vegas went second, and then went further than they did. Um, Metropolitan has opportunities by helping pay recycling programs because you don't have the same 100% recycling we do that creates water supplies, and I know they're providing financial incentives for that. And I know they've invested heavily in inside conservation as a result of that. But it's a mindset for people. When they see water running down the street, it must, there must not be a problem. There's so much psychological there's so many psychological implications that go along with that. So it's got to be a larger outreach. And it's like we are afraid to say that water could become short. And it's how you say it. As long as you can point to solutions, you can tell people the truth. <laughs> there is a water problem in the West. One more question. Yes, ma'am. Um, there's been a lot of discussion and talk about um, becoming uh, independent of oil. In other words, having our energy sources come from areas other than the oil uh, countries, the current oil OPEC countries. Uh, that involves, for as much of the talk has been growing, uh, making ethanol from farm products. In Brazil, it's sugar, and in this country, corn. That would entail huge, huge increases in the amount of water needed for growing corn. Has anyone made any estimates? Or I'm uh, so glad that's not my job. <laughs> <laughs> Has anyone made any estimates on how much water it would take for ethanol? I thought, I mean, we haven't, but I thought I saw in a news story that it would take like a third of the United States. I mean, it is an unbelievable. It's an unbelievable amount of water. And I'm not sure we have that kind of water. Well, on that note, uh, here we go. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you, Pat, for Thank you. really interesting.